Hey guys, welcome back to another Besides and On podcast. We have two guests on today. We have one from Austin, Texas, and one from Fife, uh, local to me. We have uh, Carmen, sorry, just for the pronunciation here, Carmen, Carmen yeah. Davilis. Oh my gosh, you you got that right. <laughs> Thank you yes. very much. Perfect. <laughs> You're from uh, Doggies, Doggies for Dementia, and we have Correct. Ruth McCabe here from Fife Council. Uh, you rep for Stand. Is that right? You're like a representative for that group. Yeah. Just, just so that I got that straight. So it's a de dementia awareness group uh, around about the local yeah. area in Fife here. Yeah. So the yeah. reason I've got these, uh, both these guests on is usually what happens when we try to get podcast guests, I have to message maybe five or six different people because you might get people turning things down sometimes. And I happen to message Carmen and Ruth at the same time looking to do a podcast about dementia. Um, so I thought it'd be great to get both these guys on. Um, even though they're in like completely opposite <laughs> parts of the world, <laughs> um, but I thought it'd be interesting for either you guys to talk or uh, and tell us your you guys stories. So um, I think what we'll do is um, if we get if we start off with Carmen, if Carmen could introduce yourself, please. Sure, thank you. What what a treat! What a treat to be here too. Uh, I am Carmen Develas. I was a nurse over forty years, a nurse practitioner, and my specialty was dementia care. Uh, the last decade or so of my career. And um, I left the clinical world to write a book called Just See Me and Sacred Stories from the Other Side of Dementia. I followed 13 families for a couple of years and just couldn't imagine telling those stories, sharing those really important stories, helping the world understand dementia without having photographs. And uh, that was the beginning of a photography career, a second career for me, obviously. And um, and then what I realized was the most popular photos, the most popular images on social media that actually made people stop and look and learn more about dementia included dogs, uh, that they, they were drawn into the interaction, to the joy, to the suddenly nobody has to be perfect. We're just, it's like the great equalizer is to have a dog in, in the house, right? And um, so I thought, wow, if that's where we're going to meet people, that's where we're going to meet people. And being a dog lover, that was easy for me. And so I, I founded the foundation. It's a nonprofit here in Austin, Texas, although we're nationwide and hoping to uh, come across the pond, too. And uh, we photograph families with their pets, with their, um, their uh, family dog. And uh, we share their stories. And uh, that's how we support families and we raise awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just, um, just about a year old. So we, I had did the, done this for a year before started the nonprofit, uh, that whole thing, and it's of course that was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So yeah, it's, yeah, uh, it's been something. Mm -hmm. you go. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Ruth? How did you get into this? Well, my background is also nursing, Carmen, but it was, um, I trained as a nurse way back in the sorry, 70s. Sorry, Ruth, sorry, and... could you maybe move back from the camera? You're right in there. Oh. There you go. Okay. Perfect, that's perfect right Better. there. Yeah. The, um, so my background is also nursing. I trained way back in the 70s, and I have had two spells of working with people with dementia. Um, one when I worked in an HIV and AIDS hospice in Edinburgh, and lots of people got HIV and cephalopathy which was a form of dementia. And then I came to work with Alzheimer's Scotland later on in my career and worked with people mostly with younger onset dementia. Um, my job at the moment is working for an organization called the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership. And my job is to make the kingdom of Fife dementia friendly. So basically I knock on doors of businesses, organizations, individuals and inspire them to become dementia friendly. And we do that through dementia friends training and we give advice on the physical environment. So encourage them to do things like signage and what have you and buy colour toilet seats. That's always the thing, get a colour toilet seat. Um, I came across the group Stand because one of the chaps, uh, Jerry, who was the founder member of Stand, Jerry wanted to meet with his peers, people of his own age who were you know, living with dementia. And he encouraged his specialist nurse, Maggie, to set up the group. And I got involved. So the members of STAND, STAND is a peer support group uh, for people with younger onset dementia and their families and friends. And they're from all across the kingdom of Fife. Um, and we meet quite regularly when we can, when the rules allow face to face. But we've also done quite a lot of work on Zoom. 
Um, and we've become quite activist, actually. They're informing policy and practice all over the country now. So a really, really kind of positive, affirming, uh, creative, imaginative group. So marvellous, marvellous people. Um, but the most important thing is we love dogs. <laughs> Loads mm -hmm. of people in the group have got dogs. Um, one of the girls lives on her own and she's got a wee <clears throat> dog and she just wouldn't be anywhere without them. So uh, they're very popular dogs, very helpful. Um, but there is a formal dementia dog project in Scotland that's run um, through Alzheimer's Scotland. So they train dogs like um, dogs for the blind, uh, assistance dogs. So they actually place them with people with dementia. Um, there's not many of them because obviously it's quite expensive to train them. Um, but I think there's about three or four dogs placed with families across Scotland. So if you wanted to come across and connect with us, Carmen, they would be good people to talk to. Um, oh they've, my God. Mod they've modelled that on Australia. I think they've, they did a lot of work in Australia on the dementia dog. So we've sort of adopted the project from Australia. But we love mm -hmm. dogs and dogs are hugely important. Um, yeah. along with other animals, of course, but dogs particularly important to people with dementia. Oh, we have so much in common. <laughs> and I, I graduated in 1979, so I'm oh, in the 70s too. Time. Wow, goodness, oh well, there you are, a kindred spirit, excellent. Yes, oh my gosh, yeah, how times Thank have you. changed too. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. It's amazing yeah. to hear about the, the kind of the pet thing. Is it the same with sort of any pets? And like you, I've seen um, things on YouTube where you talk about um, people with dementia getting to hear music from like uh, from like when they were younger and stuff. There was a particularly moving video with there was a guy from I think it was like the forties or fifties. Um, he he had like a, a huge uh, a huge love and passion for music for the forties and fifties. And when he got to hear that music, I think someone brought in like a MP3 player to the guy. The guy completely livened up and it was like amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, we oh, yeah. use music a lot, Steve. The, a lot of our members of Stand have got the Alexa gadget. Yeah, So yeah. they just say to Alexa, play, um, and they play the uh, songs. And a lot of them have got the Alexa show, which shows the words. So okay. if people have forgotten the words to songs, the Alexa shows them so they can sing along quite well. Um, and I understand that Alexa will actually create your own playlist. So the songs that you ask her to play constantly then becomes your playlist. So the music is hugely important to a lot of people. Um, so yeah, so it really, really matters. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing, it's amazing. So... Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, dementia to start with. Um, sorry, actually, I wrote something down as you were talking, Ruth. You mentioned coloured toilet seats. Is there a specific <laughs> thing for this? Like, I, I don't know anything about this. Could you um, explain this? The, the problem for people with dementia, Steve, nowadays is that all the toilets are white. Everywhere you go, toilets are white. I mean, I was in the generation where we had avocado toilet suites and pink toilet suites and all the rest of it. But we've yeah. become very clinical now and everything's white. The problem for people with dementia is they can't differentiate the different shapes. So if everything's the same color, they can't tell where the toilet pan is. Um, so you get women in particular who might go to sit on the pan and what happens is they maybe have a wee tumble because they can't quite see the seat. And right. what you get is men doing the usual man thing and they kind of, forgive me, but they pee on the floor because they miss the toilet. Yeah. Um, so what we encourage people to do is to make the sort of contrast the, the sort of basic message with dementia is have bold, plain and contrasting colours. So you're not going to get away from the white toilet pan and the white cistern and all the rest of it. I think that white's here to stay. But if you can colour up your bathroom and put a coloured toilet seat on the pan, people will do much better. And we prefer the sort of bold colours like, you know, blue, yellow, green, red, these kind of things. But anything that's got a tinge is better than white. Um, and actually what we've discovered is that even people who've got visual issues will struggle with everything that's pure white. So the message from us is add a bit of colour, but plain colour, not patterns particularly, plain colour. Um, so bold, contrasting, plain, so colour toilet seats. But hardly anybody has colour toilet seats, I have to say. But And what we say to people is, you know, if the toilet seat breaks, put a coloured one on and it will make the difference. Um, and even in urinals, we encourage, I've never come across a coloured urinal, I have to say, but 
if you get, you know, you get these bleach blocks that are like blue, if you put them in the bottom of the urinal, that actually helps people to see where they're aiming, if that helps. So that's why colour toilet seats. There you go. Is that be your experience, Carmen? Yes, yes. And it's sometimes those simple things, right? So we don't think about it, but with uh, it's a visual spatial difficulty, like the distance and um, even if there's, we well, mentioned patterns in carpet, um, that a friend of mine had an early onset and when we traveled in, in airports where the carpet changed, it looked like it was a hole. It didn't look like it continued and that led him to stumble because he was thinking there's a step or there's something there. And um, mm -hmm. so the visual issues are, um, could be a big part of it. And mm -hmm. sometimes like the first things, symptoms we'll see. Yeah, and, people and that's definitely. not something that's widely known about dementia, Steve. People yeah. always yeah. think that dementia yeah. is just about losing your memory. But certainly the spatial awareness, I mean, it's often one of the reasons why people have to stop driving. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of our lads, uh, he kept banging into the curb and he couldn't park the car. So the way that he was seeing the world was quite distorted. But again, it's not something that's often known about dementia. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly the bold plane contrasting is a lot better. And Carmen was talking about the flooring. If often shops and businesses have got black uh, rugs at the, the entrance to the shop. And obviously, well, particularly in Scotland, it's because it's a pretty wet country and our feet are always dirty. But actually, people with dementia can see that as like a hole in the floor. So mm -hmm. they won't walk into it. They think they're going to sink. So yeah. again, these simple things, if we can encourage people to change, even if they made them at red or something or a deep blue, but it's the black, it just looks like a black hole. And if you've got something that's like very tiled with like squares, the people with dementia can see that, that the edging is like a crack. So what they will do is step over it. So it looks like they're <laughs> walking funny and they would draw attention to themselves, but it's just the way that they're seeing the world. And because people don't understand that, they think, oh, these people are just a bit daft or, you know, they've been a bit stupid or whatever. But actually, it's the dementia and it's the way that they're seeing the world that's the problem. Um, this is yeah. this is one of the things that you, you, you uh, with the colour toilet seats thing, uh, I, I didn't realise. Again, like you said, you assume, like most people just think it's a memory loss thing. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it, it does make sense that, it would, that, it, that it would include... Um, motor skills and kind of like uh, positioning and mm -hmm. all those kind of things, which I get you've blown my mind with. Unbelievable. So, wow. right. yeah, well, hopefully and there's, we there's oh, I was going to say, there's kind of two things about that, too, is the safety factor, of course, mm -hmm. but then there's the that it, when there's problems, it, it, a person feels like they're being they look different than others and they stick out and yeah. drawing attention that they would rather not. And um, I'm sure you've seen this too, Ruth, but it's one of the things about the dogs is that they are, there's no need to be anything but who you are. And so yeah. the stress of um, being perfect or not making mistakes or worrying about the, you know, if you're um, embarrassing family or family being embarrassed for that matter, you know, either way from the family's point of view or for the person with dementia, that, that's one of the joys of the dog is like, it, they don't care. <laughs> Yeah. They're going to love you no matter what, or they're going to play no matter what. It's there's no and um, yeah. yeah, no judgment I mean, there, and that's a real gift. No judgment. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean Carmen's right. I mean you know there's still a huge stigma around dementia, um, and I mean you know that's one of the reasons that I've got the job that I have because that's what we're trying to do is reduce that stigma, yeah. help people to understand the disease a lot more. And not be so frightened of it, because certainly in our part of the world, if you ask people nowadays what frightens them most, you know, 20 years ago, people would have said cancer. Nowadays, people say that it's dementia. So what we want to do is try to help people to understand that with the right kind of support, people with dementia can live ordinary and meaningful lives in the community. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have to sit at home and not come out and do anything. Um, yeah. And as Carmen says, something like a dog, you know, that sort of unconditional love where you can just, you know, cuddle up to the dog and whatever you do doesn't matter. It's just so helpful because actually humans round about aren't always that responsive. I mean, mm -hmm. one of our the one of the women in the group talks about when she got a diagnosis, you know, she kind of felt that, well, it could have been worse. You know, she could have been told she had three months to live or something could have been worse. So she came out thinking, well, you know, I've got this illness, but I can live my life. 
but actually it was people round about her who stopped her being able to do that. Their perception of her was, well, her life's over, so what's the point? And, you yeah. know, so many people, when they get a diagnosis of dementia, they do, they think their life's over. Suicide is not uncommon. Um, you know, depression, you know, that kind of sense of, well, you know, what can I do, you know? So that's the kind of thing that we're desperately trying to change, that it's an illness like any other, you know, okay, you might be incapacitated in some way, but actually you can still do things. And that's certainly what the stand group are demonstrating. They're clearly living their lives and making a difference. And that's marvelous, marvelous stuff. Yeah, it's a huge part of our mission, too. I mean, one thing I realized, I'm even I learned after I left the clinic, even people shared more information. And the thought was they said, well, we thought if we told you how difficult it was that you would tell us we had to go, you know, placement or, you know, that that they felt like they were failing and there's just so much guilt anyway. And and all and I just thought well what's the biggest thing what do you want people to know and they're just like we just want them to know that this is it's not like what people think it is this is a long course and the being in the world myself dementia world I'm like really and and so I started asking people that I knew really educated people but who didn't know anything about dementia and like tell me what you do know based on what you've seen Mm -hmm. and they said everybody was old which is of course not true uh, that um, that people were diagnosed and died shortly after, which is not true at all, and that most people are cared for in a nursing home, which is totally not true. Most people are at home and cared for by their families. And I thought, no wonder the p- families felt misunderstood and kept kind of quiet uh, because, and literally they said people would step away, physically mm-hmm. step away because mm-hmm. of the fear. Mm-hmm. And as part of why we do what we do, we're like, well, okay, we'll tell the stories and we'll we'll do it in a way that's from a compassionate and loving place that's reduced fear. And maybe people will read it a little bit more. And in, in fact, that is exactly what we've seen. Exactly what we've seen. Um, I mean, there's a lot of statistics we could we could um, tout and it's mm-hmm. scary. And um, but when you make a human side and make us smile a little bit, it's a whole different story. Mm-hmm. Are those yeah, some of the some of the pictures that you do behind you, Carmen? Yes, yes. Yes, they're lovely. <laughs> if, if, if anybody can see that, <laughs> you can have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and um, yeah, the the ones primarily that you can see. This is a uh, um, Carol who is um, nine, turning ninety. And we had already, I I had already spoken to her daughter and we had the sessions planned. And my sessions typically are the photo sessions with the dogs and the family. And and then I come back a week or two later and show them the photos. And we, that is also videotaped and photographed. And I videotape pretty much everything now, because what I found was during the sessions, people would say things when they hadn't really spoken very much. And I'm like, how do I capture that? And the first time I missed something really big, when um, a mother, had, her daughter said, I just love you, mama. And the other one said, I love you too, mama. And she hadn't spoken in months. And she looked and she said, well, I love you too. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just have the still pictures. And that day I went and got a video camera. So I always have a video camera going over my shoulder and a couple different angles and uh, for Carol, her daughter said she out of the blue, she didn't even know about the photo session planned. And she said, you know, I've always wanted to be a movie star uh-huh. and I never got my chance. <laughs> and so <laughs> her for her reveal, so the second session, then we had it in a movie theater and we showed the video slideshow in the in the. Um, because I thought she's not going to know that she's an Instagram, you know, famous person now, or that Facebook lights up because they're following her story. She's not going to know that. And uh, so we created this red carpet event and um, she last year with the um, lockdown and just the progress, she declined really terribly. And, um, but her daughter says she'll walk by and look at the picture with the dog, the white dog. And um, and just say, that dog is so soft, so Mm -hmm. soft. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of, and I, I like, we know that there's memories of that, even if she can't tell us, 
-hmm. that was a real special thing. Mm -hmm. And she actually shared things in our little video interview that her daughter didn't even know that she felt that way. And we captured that on video. And um, I didn't know her daughter didn't know how she felt about her. And some of these really, really, um, they had different perspectives on the same event that happened, like when her daughter went to college, how her daughter felt her mother felt about <coughs> it, and how when Carol was talking and she's crying, and it was it was a shocker. And she said her daughter said, "You know, I'm 65. I would have gone the rest of my life not knowing how my mother felt about me." Yeah. And I'm like, "Oh my goodness, I you can't put a price on that. You know, you just that's just that's what makes life." just juicy just wonderful yeah definitely yeah, definitely. yeah. 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 You go. what a story what a story um, what a story right yeah <laughs> and then i've got so many but I'm like, <laughs> we only have 30 minutes but yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah i mean and i i find that i know i know you too ruth i can hear the passion in your voice and like this is why we have such passion for what we do because we know the lives that it's touched and among and ourselves i mean my life wouldn't be the same without these wonderful um, experiences and the stories and the people because what a vulnerable position to be in to open up your home and your heart to say yeah we're going to share our story and these times with with you with me mm -hmm. and to trust that I will put that across for them that's a huge huge thing and I, yeah. I, I recognize that amazing, yeah. amazing. so I had um, I just had a, a few notes written um, one of the notes I had written was the early signs of dementia. If you could go through maybe some of the early signs just for people. Again, we're hoping to break out some information for people on this podcast, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the early signs? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Well, I, I'll just say, you know, the most common one that we hear about is memory problems. And uh, people will start like me. Like I've got almost three businesses now, right? And I'm 62 and I'm thinking, oh, okay, I might forget things here and there. But that's not so much what we're looking at. It's kind of like, it's not that you forget where you left the keys. It's like you forget that you left them in the freezer and, and things like that. And, um, but it starts with some of the memory problems and more short-term memory typically. The, the brain is a magnificent organ and it, you know, Alzheimer's disease affects a certain part of the brain primarily, but there are many types of dementia. So the symptoms are, are varied, but memory loss is the one we see pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, we talked about the, the gait, the balance and the visual spatial type things. Yeah. yeah. Ruth, I know I'm going to let you take that. <laughs> I can tell you're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I talk about is the kind of sequential functioning, which sounds a bit of a grand term, but one of the things that affects people is the ability to do things in a sequential order. So if you even think of things like making tea, you know, you have to find the kettle, you have to fill it with water, you have to plug it in, switch it on, get the cup, get the tea, get the sugar, get the milk, whatever. There's about 30 steps involved in making a cup of tea. So people might start to serve you cold tea because they haven't boiled the water or they might give you a cup of boiling water but haven't put the tea bag or the coffee right. in. So people missing out steps in a sequential process is quite a, 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 yes. an indicator. Um, people, we always talk about people who've been really good home bakers. We have lots of really good home bakers in Fife. They're marvellous home bakers. I think it's built into the genes. But, you know, people who've made the most marvellous, fluffy, light scones start to make, like, doorstops. And it's because they're not managing the recipe in the same way. You know, mm -hmm. they're either missing out a step or they're doing things in the wrong sort of order. Yeah. So sequential functioning, though. So, you know, Jerry, the chap who was the founder in a uh, stand, he, he worked on a computer programme. He was working for the council and he was doing... Um, modifications in people's houses and he had to work out a computer program that measured space and distance and put all the gadgets in place and things. Jerry would describe himself for the best part of two years not managing to work that program, something that he'd worked for the best part of 30 years but all of a sudden he couldn't work his way through the steps required and yeah. he got, he had a marvellous colleague who was hugely helpful actually but that was the kind of things that began to be an issue for him. And things like he was banging his legs and his knees and his elbows and 
he was like awkward. He, he, he wasn't moving the right way. He was like a wee bit uncoordinated. So I would always say, what, what would drive me to the doctor? Because I think we all have problems with memory. I mean, I've never met anybody who doesn't have problems with memory. But I think if you had memory issues and that sort of sequential functioning, that would be what would drive me to the doctor. You know, mm -hmm. people talk about, you know, driving their car and not quite finding their way off the roundabout. You know, they don't quite remember what exit or they go round and round the roundabout because they can't remember the exit or they, 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 they're driving somewhere and all of a sudden they don't know where they are or where they're supposed to be going. You know, these are the kind of things. And if that happens frequently, that would be when I would go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, that's the biggest one, but that functioning stuff is important too. Yeah. yeah. There's another big one I used to see in the clinic that most people didn't think about for dementia and that's judgment and insight. The decision-making yeah, yeah. is just like, wow, that's not their usual, you know, it's unexpected or maybe spending money or getting the bills mixed up or not paying things correctly or um, not, not processing the information and responding in a way that's not typical. Yeah. Yeah. Those are sometimes some of the early things too, because the, the processing is not the same. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, um, that yeah. could be a big one. Yeah. 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 There you go. There you go. I got some of that was interesting because, uh, again, back to people assuming that it's like blocks of memory that people forget. It's basically the brain is not in control of what it's doing a lot of the time. So it's just forgetting things at certain times. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, uh, again, not sequential. So again, so that's again, that's that's a open my mind up a bit more to yeah, what it and that's part of why, by the way, music can be a real yeah. trigger in a in a good way. It can also trigger in the opposite way too, depending on what memories associated with the music, mm -hmm. or uh, certain aromas as well. That's often like a really big. We'll smell something and it take us right back to a time or place, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so longer term memories can remain fairly intact for many people. They'll remember things from years ago in great detail, but you can just ask them what day of the week is it or something. And they're like, oh, you know, I don't know. I just looked that up. I don't remember uh, because of the shorter term mm -hmm. uh, memories yeah. impacted. Yeah. yeah. One of the analogies we use on the training we do is that dementia is like a set of fairy lights. So if you think of your Christmas lights in the old days when I was a child, you brought the Christmas tree out the loft and you put the lights on it. And of course, the lights never worked. You know, you had to change the bulbs or screw the bulbs in or whatever. So we describe dementia as a wee bit like that. So sometimes all the bulbs work and the person's fine. Sometimes only some work and there's a change in function or personality or behaviour. And then the next day, these lights come back on, but another set of lights don't work. So there's another change. So it's the unpredictability of living with dementia that's one of the biggest challenges. So, you know, Jerry talks about going on the bus to the leisure centre. He has to get two buses, you know, and what he does is he ends up in Cowden Beath. He's supposed to get off at, you know, uh, Michael Wood Centre in Glen Office. He ends up in Cowden Beath because the lights go off and he completely forgets to get off the bus. And yeah. one of the women, <laughs> she was a, a head teacher, a deputy head teacher in a local school. She went to work one day without her dress on. She had her, like, her, you know, wee vesty thing and tights and what have in her coat, but she forgot to put her dress on. Right. So, you know, these kind of light bulb moments are just quite <clears throat> easy. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, I think, one, and that, I think that's one of the reasons why people stay at home, because they're a wee bit worried about when the lights go off, what will happen? You know, will mm -hmm. I get home? Will I be able to find the bus? Will I be able to find my way home? Will I be able to pay for my cup of tea if I go into the shops? Will I manage my shopping? So I think people become quite risk averse and decide, well, actually, it's safer to be at home. But of course, as we all know from the last year, being locked up at home is the worst thing in the world for all of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So from that point of view, we would encourage. That's why we're trying to make the world dementia friendly, because then people can go out. So if they have yeah. a light bulb moment, somebody will give them a bit of a hand. Um, you know, you can go into the shops and if you can't manage your money, you know, if you trust the shopkeeper, you can give the shopkeeper your money and trust that they'll give you the right change rather than you trying to count it all out. That local response is really, really important. Mm -hmm. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah, so, I say that. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that as we, we raise awareness, we create a more compassionate and kind and loving world because when we know better, we do better. 
And yeah. that's just what we're going for, you know, just yeah. just to know better. Mm-hmm. Certainly, there you go. So um, in order to combat some of the kind of myths out there, uh, what myths come up sort of most often? What would you like to crush? <laughs> most, so, like what, what myths would you like to go over and uh, yes. put to bed? Well, my mm. big one, Steve, is it's not the end of the world. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. A dementia diagnosis does not have to mean that you stop everything. Um, it's about you know living your life as best you can and doing what you can, but also getting a diagnosis early because so many people are so embarrassed about the thought that they've got dementia. They don't go to the doctor. By the time they go, the dementia is quite advanced, and by which time they've lost a lot of skill, they've lost a lot of confidence, there's already quite complicated patterns of behaviour set up that you can't change. So early diagnosis, and if people can be less fearful of the illness, we're more likely to get... It's a bit like cancer. You know, 20 years ago, you know, people were very reluctant to get diagnosed with cancer. We didn't talk about it. We called it the big C. You know, people died never knowing that they had cancer. So we have to do that same journey with dementia. It's an illness like any other, and you can live with it. Early, early diagnosis means that there might be medication that can help. It doesn't cure it, but it might slow it down. So these are the messages that I want to give, but don't let it be the end of the world because how you respond to the diagnosis will determine how you live with it. Yeah. And find that time and time. Like stand. Yeah. <laughs> find find yeah. people in the same situation. <laughs> I'm totally with you, Ruth. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We talk to people with dementia. Uh, ex- it's called experts. So some of the experts are family members and the people with it. And that's the what you just said, Ruth, is really it. They're like, the, the thing that I didn't know is that when I got the diagnosis, that that wasn't the end. And then some became big advocates and it's expanded their lives in ways they had no idea that that would be the journey in life and there's travel and they speak and it's just helped them tremendously as well as uh, some of the medical trials. And, and I would say even 10 years ago as a clinician, the, some of the, or 15, I would say the thought is, well, we could diagnose, it's not going to make a big difference. And what we do um, is more, of course, a lot of that when people were in their 80s or something like that, but it still did matter. And it certainly matters younger because typically symptoms begin a, a good 10 years before diagnosis. I don't know if you knew that or not, but people will say, or families will say, I noticed this like five or six years ago. I just didn't know what to do. And I'm like, imagine if, if, and not to put the shame on that because they're doing the best they can, but five or six years of treatments or physical therapy, <clears throat> occupational therapy, the cognitive work to help people be at their best, yep. what a difference that could make in their outcome overall. And we are seeing people live longer with dementia than we used to. Yep. Uh, they're yep. diagnosed earlier. But also we know better how to manage and we've got a long way to go. I mean, we know like this much of what we need to know, uh, but it, it's, it's making a big difference. And, and that's, those are people's lives. And, um, and you're right about cancer. I use that a lot, especially breast cancer. I think about my earlier days, people didn't say it. Women really struggle totally on their own. Uh, with the stigma associated with that. And when people started sharing their stories and took the chance to get out there and talk about it and show, that's when people, the other people who didn't know about it learned and became less fearful and more supportive. And now it's a whole different world for women with breast cancer than it was say in the eighties and nineties or even early 2000s. And and I'm with you, Ruth, that's what we're trying to do with regard to dementia. Uh, I mean, across the board and and people I talk to, the bottom line is like stigma and education. Mm -hmm. I mean, our our people in STAND, they talk about, you know, a diagnosis of dementia being like a series of losses. You know, as Carmen said earlier on, you know, family and friends often disappear. People don't quite know how to handle it. You know, it's a bit like when you're bereaved, people cross the street, you know, they don't know what to say to you, so they don't talk to you. So people talk about a whole series of losses and being completely and utterly de-skilled. I mean, most of our people had to leave work because of the diagnosis. 
There, I've never worked with a, anybody. I've never supported anybody who's worked with dementia. So workplaces need to think about, well, you know, if there's an aging workforce, how are we going to support people? As Carmen said, you know, if you're going to get diagnosed even in your 70s, you'll be starting to display the dementia in your 60s. You know, we're not getting state pensions in this country to 68 or whatever. So we're going to have to be a lot more supportive of people with dementia and keep them doing what they can do for as long as possible. Because otherwise, you know, people will just sit there thinking, well, my life is over. But, you know, people get a huge amount out of feeling that they can make a difference. I mean, we've had some marvellous sessions in the schools. We managed to get some dementia friend sessions with young people in the schools. I mean, for the lady who was a, a deputy head teacher, you know, thrown on the scrap heap, you know, you're no good, you can't do this job anymore. To go back into a classroom and have an experience with children was just so powerful for her. You know, it brought back all her skill, ability, knowledge, experience. I was absolutely terrified of these kids. <laughs> and, and she was just marvellous. You know, and I'm thinking, wow, this is just great. You know, we had a marvellous experience. So it, it's about yeah. helping people to maximise what they can do. And I mean, there is a huge element of risk in that. But actually, I know for myself, I'd much rather live in a world where I could go for a walk and potentially, you know, get a bit lost or whatever and actually sit in the house in a chair and just vegetate, I mean, that just would be yeah. so destructive. So, you know, and there's lots of things you can put in place like technology and stuff to help that kind of thing nowadays, but mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have to be a death sentence. Yeah, mm -hmm. it could have just, uh, we only have like, like a minute left of recording, mm -hmm. so um, uh, is there anything else you want to promote before we go? Guys? I'm and happy it, to do dementia friends training with anybody in fight if anybody wants to be involved. Happy to do some wee bits of training. We've got a video that we can share that people could use as a sort of training tool. Happy to yeah. share it. Awesome. Yep. Um, and and I'm working with photographers around the country and I, anywhere, honestly, could learn what I do and can support families and be part of Doggies for Dementia. We're, we're a nonprofit. We're anywhere. We, we, we're everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere we can go. So again, Carmen, before I start, um, if, if you have any issues with the Scottish accent, you might, uh, as we go along, I, I'm known for speaking quite fast. So if you have any issues, uh, just tell me to start again, okay? Okay, I didn't understand what you just said. <laughs> exactly what I was talking about there, perfect. I Oh, this is really <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So, so that basically goes to show you what I meant there, right there. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs>